Welcome to the Copper Spice YouTube channel, and thanks for joining us. In this video, we are going to talk about some related C++ topics. C++ Tapas. There are several C++ topics which are too small for their own video, so we decided to group them together since they are somewhat related. The keyword typedef was a carryover from C and has been around for a very long time. The using keyword was already in C++ 98, but it had an unrelated meaning. The ability to declare a type alias with the using keyword was added in C++ 11. Both the typedef and using keywords declare what is called a type alias. A type alias is simply a new name for an existing data type. It cannot be used to declare a new data type. While the using statement is preferred in modern C++ code, the typedef keyword has the same effect in most cases. The two declarations shown here have exactly the same meaning and effect. As we just mentioned, the semantics of a typedef are the same as the using type alias. However, the using keyword has the ability to declare a templated type alias, whereas typedef cannot do this. The syntax for a templated type alias is just like any other template, where the template parameters appear before the declaration. An odd and maybe not often used syntax exists for a typedef, which is not allowed for the using keyword. You can declare multiple type aliases in one statement. This is actually very confusing syntax, but it is legal. It is no longer considered a good practice, so you shouldn't really do this. But in this example, the int is applied to each of the three type aliases. The first one is pretty much readable, since the alias of my type is right next to the int. You can sort of read the second one, but the third alias is really just annoying since the return type of int is so far away from the type declaration. A pound define is actually a macro which causes a text substitution during the preprocessor phase of compiling. A type def or type alias does not do a literal substitution and is resolved by the compiler, not the preprocessor. If you use a pound define where you should have used a type alias, you may have an unexpected result. One issue is that the macro substitution will most likely occur in a much broader scope than you intended, since macro substitution does not observe any of the C++ scoping rules. The other issue is how a macro substitution is done versus the expansion of a type alias. In the case of var1, the declaration will be an int star, as you expect. However, since a star in a declaration does not propagate to subsequent variables, the data type for var2 will be int, not pointer to int. In real code, the pound define may not be anywhere close to the actual declaration, and this potential error is going to be difficult to track down. In the type alias for var3 and var4, both of them will have a data type of int star, which is probably what you wanted. A type alias has several useful qualities. The most obvious is that it can improve readability of your code, and it prevents you from needing to type a long or complicated data type in multiple locations. Another useful reason is for platform independence. Since a type alias follows the normal C++ scoping, it is not a good idea to put one in the global scope, since it would be available everywhere in your code. If you do add a type alias in the global scope, ensure it is well documented and has a meaningful purpose. This example shows what is called a trivial type alias. While the code may be correct, it does not contribute much to the code base. Here are some examples of when you might want to use a type alias. Since the syntax for a function pointer can be difficult to read in a declaration, Setting up a type alias for a function pointer data type makes your code easier to comprehend. In the second example, we are declaring a type alias for a map container, which has a long and complex 
key data type. Having to type this multiple times can be tedious and may clutter your code a bit. By adding the type alias for just the container, it becomes easier to see whether you are using the container data type or referring to something like the container iterator. Type defs are used extensively in the C++ standard library. The main purpose for a type alias in the STL is for platform independence and portability. For example, each container in the standard library has a type def which declares the alias size underscore type. The two examples shown are common declarations you might find in an STL header file for a vector. The data type for size underscore t will be defined in a header file provided by your compiler. This header file is defined by the standard and is called CSTDDEF. We mentioned size type. However, there are many other type defs also provided in the STL for each container class. Most of these are not ones you may need to use in your code, but you should be aware of them. For example, if you need to declare a variable in your code to store data returned by an STL container, it would be a good practice to use the appropriate type alias. This will help to ensure your code is platform independent and compatible with the algorithms provided by the standard library. In CopperSpice, we had a requirement to extend the existing STL API for the container classes. We did not write our own containers, but instead used composition by adding a data member of the type corresponding to the container. For example, our QVectorT class has a private data member with a data type of STDVectorT. Using composition was a very clean way to leverage the work of the STL and gave us a lot for free. However, using this approach, we did not gain the common type defs since we did not use inheritance. For compatibility, these had to be defined and added by hand to each of our container classes. This is a list of the aliases defined by iterator classes in the standard library. For every iterator class, there is an iterator category alias, which defines what operations that iterator supports. For example, the iterators for a vector support random access, while the iterators for a map are bidirectional. The input and output iterator tags are mostly used by stream iterators. This is a list of the aliases defined by allocator classes in the standard library. Most of these are similar to what we've discussed in the previous sections, but the rebind alias is different. It is used to convert an allocator of one data type to an allocator of a different data type. Another set of common type defs are those associated with smart pointers. The element type type alias is an alias for the data type the smart pointer is pointing to. A namespace is a way to collate a section of your code under the umbrella of a specific name. The main purpose for using a namespace is to prevent naming collisions by isolating your code. Every class and function in your program must have a unique name. If you're working on a large project with multiple developers or your code base makes use of multiple libraries, it can be a really good idea to put various sections of your code in a namespace. Code in a given namespace does not need to specify or use the fully qualified name to access a member in the current namespace. The term fully qualified name refers to the name of a class with the namespace prepended. For code outside a given namespace, which needs to access something inside that namespace, it must use the fully qualified name. It is worth mentioning that a namespace does not hide anything or prevent access to a class or method. It just adds another layer of naming. The global namespace is a unique namespace which exists by default. 
There is no requirement or even mechanism to actually declare a global namespace. There is always exactly one global namespace in an application. As an example, if you have a library linked with your application, the global namespace in the library is the same global namespace that exists in your program. Library developers must be extremely careful what identifiers and symbols they put in the global namespace. If you have a project with a large shared code base, please be cautious about using the global namespace and consider putting each library in a separate, uniquely declared namespace. The colon colon in this example is the syntax to specify that my function must be looked up in the global namespace. The C++ standard library is located in the STD namespace. Future releases of the C++ standard may use the new STD2 namespace. In addition, the committee has reserved all namespaces which start with STD and are followed by any number. If your code base has declared a namespace with the name STD followed by any number, you will need to change it to something else before you can switch to C++ 17 or later. Both of these examples were supported as of C++ 98. The C++ standard differentiates between a using directive and a using declaration. The second example makes a single symbol visible without requiring the fully qualified name. The declarations for E and F are equivalent if you have the using declaration as shown. This using declaration will make every STD identifier visible in the global namespace until the end of the current source file or translation unit. With this directive, you can omit the STD colon colon and save yourself a few seconds of typing and a few extra keystrokes. However, you're probably going to spend an hour or more when you have to track down a naming conflict or decipher if the name set refers to STD set or a data member in your class. Most coding standards really recommend that you don't use this construct, even in a single source file. You are free to declare anything you want in a namespace you define. However, there are a lot of restrictions on what you can add or declare in the existing standard library namespace. Basically, all you can add is a template specialization and all of its implementation for a user-defined data type. However, you may not add a specialized method to an existing templated class in the standard namespace. Although you can add a template specialization for a user-defined data type, there is a particular list of template classes in the standard namespace where even this has been prohibited. For example, you are not allowed to specialize any of the type traits like is enum. The full list of prohibited classes is scattered throughout the standard, and there is a nice summary of this list on CPP reference. A forward declaration is a way to indicate to the compiler that a particular data type exists and will be fully defined at some later time during the compile phase. If the compiler really needs the full definition, and the declaration is insufficient, you will receive a compiler error about use of an incomplete type. This example we're showing is a forward declaration that simply establishes that a class with the name widget exists. The first block of code here attempts to forward declare the class string in the STD namespace. This is syntactically valid code, and the namespace name will be prepended to the class, so this will yield a forward declaration of std string. However, you are not allowed to forward declare anything in the std namespace, so this results in undefined behavior. The second example is a syntax error, since you are not permitted to specify a scope in the body of a forward declaration. The third example is also a syntax error for the same reason. 
The last example is valid code and will forward declare a class named string in the namespace myNS. Since you cannot forward declare any class in the STD namespace, the C++ standard provides a few header files which contain commonly required forward declarations. The header file iosfwd is provided by the standard and forward declares classes like iStream and OStream. In the Copper Spice library, we have a class called QString8. There is also a type alias for QString8 called QString. By creating the QString FWD header file, we give users a simple way to forward declare the string types provided in Copper Spice. This gives the flexibility to change the implementation of these classes without the need to refactor the entire Copper Spice library. This header file is a very convenient way to encapsulate all the details of forward declaring multiple string data types. For more information about Copper Spice as well as the other libraries that we have developed, please visit our website at www.copperspice.com. Thanks for watching. We hope you found the content of value. If you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to leave a comment on this video or send us private email. Please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and come back in two weeks for our next video.